David's going to read for us. John chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but this thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Father, we are all Judas, but for the blood and sacrifice of Christ. His elect are the object of his love, because they were given to him by the Father. If we are washed by his blood and his spirit, we have eternal salvation. Open our hearts to the truth. Amen. What a great portion of scripture we have to consider together today. And I've entitled this Distinctive Love. What we're seeing here is the distinctive love of the Lord Jesus Christ for that people that the Father gave him for which he came into this world to lay down his life. That's why it says there in verse 1 that having loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end that's a complete statement as to how it is any sinner is saved it's only because God has set his love upon him and sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to pay their sin debt love of God doesn't change that's why those that preach up some general love of God for everybody and somehow in the end some that he loves end up being condemned anyway that's not love here we see the distinctive love of God in Christ for sinners that he came to save some common synonyms of the word distinctive might be particular or peculiar love for a particular person. I've always said that if I showed up at the house and my wife asked me, well, honey, do you love me? And I said to her, well, darling, you know I love you just like I love every other woman in the world. She would be appalled. That's not distinctive love, but that's how preachers portray God's love. It's just over anybody and everybody. He loves everybody just the same. But that's not distinctive love. Distinctive means indicating a particular person and a particular characteristic which God loves. And so here we find this set forth in the scriptures with regard to the love of Christ. Now I've written down here five distinctives of Christ's love for sinners. That always helps me if I can kind of hang the scriptures on some of these subtitles to give us some clarity and thought. And the first distinctive of God's love is, as I just stated, it is a particular love. Here we find the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 13. And remember, everything that we started in chapter 12 all the way to the end pertains to this final week 
in which the Lord Jesus Christ came to lay down his life, the Passover week. In the Jewish calendar, God established that Passover week once a year where the Passover lamb was to be slain. And so here we find our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us specifically in verse 1, doesn't it? Now, therefore, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. He's talking about his death. Just like that high priest of old that went in on the Passover day, and presented that blood before the mercy seat. So here, it's speaking of Christ's death and this particular hour that God had ordained. Think of it, from all eternity, all those thousands of years of that Passover lamb being slain, and now it comes down to this hour when the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what the Passover lamb typified, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was at this hour now that he should lay down his life. This gives us that time reference. And here our Lord Jesus was about to share the meal, that Passover meal, when it says there in verse 2, and supper being ended. This wasn't just any common ordinary meal. This would have been the Passover that our Lord Jesus was celebrating with his Disciples. Typically, the Passover was celebrated in the evening of the night before that the Passover lamb would be slain. So here in this context, even though we're in chapter 13, we have to understand that this would have been the eve from this point where Christ would go forth into the garden and he would pray that prayer in John 17. So we're still in chapter 13. We have a lot of detail, but this would have been on the eve before Christ himself would go to the cross and pay the sin debt for that people that the Father gave him. Now, I know some people argue as to the timing of this because there seem to be so many other details here that John gives that we don't find in the other Gospels. This is the only place we find where it mentions Christ kneeling down and washing the disciples' feet. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention it. And then on the other hand, we don't have any mention of the Lord's table being instituted following this in John, but it is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And for some reason, people look at that and think, well, then there's something wrong. No, the Lord gave each one of the Gospels to give us the full picture. Not any one gospel portrays the entire picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It took a whole Old Testament to describe Christ and his person and work in types and pictures and prophecies and promise. So here in the New Testament now, coming down to this hour, we find a specific teaching that John gives that the Lord purposed the others should not speak of, but he did purpose that John should write of it. Now, when it says here, the supper being ended, I know you have seen pictures of what they call the Last Supper being painted, and there's a picture of a Jesus in the middle, and then his other disciples sitting around him, all sitting up in chairs like we do in Western culture. But in verse 23, when it says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This was the way that John, when he was writing of himself, he wouldn't use his name, but it's pretty clear that John is writing about himself. And that word leaning there actually suggests the word reclining. And even though this meal fell before the official festival of the Passover, because it says there in verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, nevertheless, it shows each one of these reclining. 
Because that's the way it was done. The table was in the middle, and I'm sure there's probably some cultures that still do that way. You might think, well, that's not a very comfortable position. I gotta sit up and eat. But that was the way it was done. These were like couches around a table. And it makes sense then that when the Lord Jesus did get up to go and wash the disciples' feet, that'd be pretty tough to do with their feet underneath them sitting in a chair, wouldn't it? But reclining, you can understand it. Their feet were already out there. And that was the way it was customary for them to, to eat and to be able to converse with one another. So that's the picture that we have here. But what I want us to see here is the distinctive love of Christ for his own. There's a distinction made even here in the text as David read it, between those that were his disciples and Judas Iscariot. Because it says there in verse 2, the supper being ended. Now, Judas was there to partake with that Passover supper, just like a lot of the Jews did. They partook of the Passover year, but not necessarily did they have eyes to see how it portrayed Christ. Like people today, they go through ceremonies and they partake even of what they call the Lord's table. But just because they partake doesn't mean they know necessarily the Lord. And it's who it represents that is significant. But here specifically in verse 2, there's a distinction made between what we read in verse 1 and 2. When it says there in verse 1, having loved his own... The scriptures make it very specific. That was not everybody. Because here was one Judas, where it says, supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. That's why I say I'm not sure that Judas even himself understood at what point he would betray the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have been one of those zealots back in the day that still thought that the Messiah in coming would come to overthrow the Roman government. And so he had some personal intentions himself in thinking that somehow he would have a place in that kingdom once the Messiah overthrew the kingdom. But when it became apparent that that's not what Christ came to do, he said that my, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, then would my servants fight? So at some point in Judas's mind, he's beginning to think, I've got to get out of here. And we understand that even the Pharisees approached him to try to turn him against the Lord Jesus Christ. And even gave him money to do so. But all of this was again, as it says here, the devil having put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. It wasn't that it wasn't there already. Because anytime the devil works, he's working with an evil heart already ever since the fall, but the Lord directed. I've often said that devil, the devil is God's devil. The Lord directed that at this particular time and this particular point, it should be Judas that should betray him. And this was not a surprise to the Lord. When you read down there in verse three, Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. So even here with Judas' betrayal, the Lord is making a distinction between those that were his own that he loved unto the end. For example, that he would actually lay down his life for them. As opposed to a Judas Iscariot where the Lord said, I've chosen you, but one of you is what? The son of perdition. The Lord knew this all along, and yet none of that moved him or changed him. And so this is how our Lord is dealing here, knowing that his hour was come. This is an amazing thing to stop and think that the Lord Jesus lived in anticipation of this hour. It says there in another portion of scripture that he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. And this is not the first time we have seen how the Lord 
set his heart and mind to the cross. It's because that's where the glory of the Father would be accomplished. God having purposed to save sinners, having chosen those sinners out of the world, even before time, and for whom the Lord Jesus Christ now came. Those were his own that he came to save. And even though others sought to try to direct him in a way that he should glorify himself, so many times we've seen reading through the scriptures that his hour was not yet come. Even when they sought to take him and stone him, that wasn't how he was supposed to die. He was supposed to die on that tree because the scriptures say, cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. He was to bear the curse of that cross on that tree, the curse of his people, the sin of his people being laid to his account. So all that being so, and up to this point, the Lord knowing that his hour had not yet come, yet we find here that this is the hour for which he had come to live his life. We saw it already back there in John chapter 12, just the chapter previous, in verses 23 to 27. It says here, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come. We're in chapter 12, but we're in the final week. This is countdown. And he said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's saying glorified. Yes, Christ's death was his glorification, his exaltation. He was there as the Savior even before the world began. And this is how God purposed to honor his Son in giving him a people for whom he should come and pay their sin debt. A lot of people scratch their head and say, I don't know why God would create a fallen world. Well, what would be a savior without sinners to save? What would be grace shown except for there be sin? And that's why there's a fallen world. Adam fell, and in Adam a whole race fell in him. Many of us born into this world are born as sons of Adam. But God had purposed there be that second Adam, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom he gave a people. Adam has his race, that's all creatures, but God in Christ, the second Adam, has his race. And it would be through the death of this one. See, Adam's death only brought condemnation. Christ's death brings glorification. Because that's how God purposed to justify his people. So this is the hour that he should come. And he describes it there coming back to my text here in John chapter 13. That he should depart out of this world. Even though it doesn't specifically mention the cross there in verse 1. Yet it pre views, looks to, forward to as a shadow to the cross. And uh, this would be the shadow of the cross that we see here. His hour had come, as opposed to all the other times it says his hour had not come. And so we see that being the meaning, truly, of what it says here, that he loved his own unto the end. It says, having loved this is why I say that it's impossible to read the scriptures and understand in any sense that Christ would have laid down his life for every single person in the world. How do you love somebody even unto the end and then in the end turn around and condemn them? It's clear in scripture. Even people like to quote John 3.16. That's the big verse they like to quote. Well, doesn't the Bible say God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They can quote it. I learned that when I was still four or five years old. But you go back and read what John 3, 16 is saying. When it says, for God so, that word so is in this manner, loved the world. How did he love the world? Well, that he gave his only begotten son. But it doesn't say he gave him for everybody, does it? Go back and read it. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not everybody believes.
There's a whole world. You can divide it up between those that believe and those that don't. How is it that any sinner believes? It's God that gives the faith to believe. John wrote about that in John chapter 1. If you go all the way back to the beginning of this gospel. How is it that any believe? It's true. It says in verse 11, he came unto his own, his own received him not. That's a different own. <laughs> That's talking about the Jews. It's not the same as here when we read, he loved his own, which were in the world. There's a distinctive love there. Here, he came unto his own. That is the Jews. Of anybody, they should have been prepared for his coming because they were given the scriptures. And yet they received him not. But look at verse 12. But as many as received him. How did any receive him? It tells us. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. That's the only why, reason they received it. They were given that power to believe on him. Even them that believe on his name. And it says which were born not of blood. So it doesn't mean that you come into this family just through blood lineage just because your parents may have been christian doesn't mean that that necessarily precludes you are not by blood nor of the will of the flesh a lot of people like to preach up a so-called free will but here it says not of the will of the flesh everything pertaining to this flesh is nothing but corruption it cannot believe nor of the will of man that talks about I hear people talking about, well, if we all join together and join hands and agree that this one here has got to be converted, we, we pray enough, God's going to honor it. Convert, not of the will of man, but of God. So that's what we see here of these, this particular love, this distinctive love of Christ, whereby he loved his own unto God. The end. Now, when it says unto the end, it has in view the cross, but it doesn't mean that after the cross, then he stopped loving. It's unto whatever that end is. Just like in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God and came and dwelt among us. Whatever that beginning is, go all the way back to eternity. Here, whatever the end is, as far out as you can foresee this love of God in Christ is distinctive for his own. They were his own because they were chosen of God the Father and given to Christ. They were his own because he gave himself for them. That's why he laid down his life. And they were his own because he was the one who had drawn each one to him by his spirit. You ask yourself, what was the difference between Peter and Judas? Because both denied the Lord. But Peter was one of his own. He was one that the Lord said, Satan has desired to sift you, but I have prayed for you. Why was Peter spared? It's because he had Christ as his representative who would pay for his sin debt. Otherwise, Peter's betrayal of Christ was no different than Judas. The only difference is Judas was left to himself and had no representative and was never drawn by the Spirit to Christ. Imagine having walked all those years with Christ, having gone out with the other disciples two by two and represented Christ. Judas did it outwardly, but he had not been drawn by the Spirit. And that's why in the end... It says here that the devil, having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. He was the devil's all along. That's what it is to be a son of perdition. It means to be born in that condemnation, to live in that condemnation, and to die in that condemnation under the delusion of the devil, who was a, the deceiver from the beginning. So I hope you see here the distinguishing love of God. His distinctive love is a particular love. But secondly, his distinctive love is a distinguishing love. You say, well, now you're, you're kind of mincing words there. What's the difference between a distinctive love and a distinguishing love? 
I'll use an example of a father with my children. I love them all equally. They're loved of me as the father, but I love each one in a particular way, according to their person, according to who they are. It doesn't change my love for them, but nonetheless, there is that distinguishing love. It doesn't mean here, for example, when John wrote of his experience in verse 23 that he was leaning and reclining on Jesus' bosom, that one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, he is describing there that particular relationship that he had with the Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus didn't love the others or loved them any less. Love has no distinction in that sense, but it's his love as a shepherd for his sheep. He knows every one of his sheep. He knows their weaknesses, and he directs each one according to that love. That's what I see here as being described. And you can certainly see it here with regard to Peter. Peter was a spokesman. He was often the one that would speak up and ask questions later. And yet the Lord did not love him any less than he did John, who was leaning on Christ's breast, that special relationship John had. And yet Peter benefited from the distinguishing love of Christ. How patient. You stop and think about Peter speaking up when the Lord told him that he would be taken and, and uh, judged by the Pharisees. And Peter said, no matter where you go, I'll go with you. You know, whether it's prison or death, he spoke up. And the Lord said to him, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. The Lord knew him. That was a loving thing for him to say to Peter. It was a wake-up call. And that's why later when he sat around that fire and Christ was in the judgment hall and uh, different ones said, you're one of those disciples. It says three times he denied the Lord with cursing. <laughs> you talk about bringing out swearing. There he was sitting around the fire swearing. I've never known him. And then when Christ came out, Christ didn't even say a word. It says he looked upon Peter. And what does the scripture say? Peter wept. That's a distinguishing love. Whereby just Christ looked upon him. He dealt with Peter in a different way that he dealt with John or any of these others. Although it was his eternal love for them that brought them together. And so I see that here with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ in these verses, that here they were all about this table, and yet the Lord knowing each one of his own. I'm thankful it's that way. <laughs> how I am as a sheep is particular to me, just like how you are as a sheep. You may not face the same trials and temptations that I do. It doesn't change the love of God if we're one of his, but oh, how Christ's love is distinctive and distinguishing for each one of us. He knows me better than I know myself. And yet he's never cast me off. And so we see that here, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, it says there, and that he, verse 3, when it says knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that includes Judas. That's why Christ prayed over there in John chapter 17. This is the prayer that he prays in the garden. All of this is in the same time setting, just before he went to the cross. But in John 17, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy name that thy son also may glorify thee. The work of salvation is the work between the father and the son. That's where the work is done. Here we have Christ praying for his own, just like he did back here. He loved his own even unto the end. Where were they, by the way, when he was praying this? Fast asleep. They had no clue. How many times we've slumbered and we've slept, yet our salvation is not dependent upon us holding Christ. It's him holding us. I'm thankful. 
But here in verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. That word power means authority. That he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. If you see one verse in scripture, it's sufficient to establish the truth. But here we see it already back here in John 13. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. That includes all flesh. That includes Judas Iscariot. Judas was not acting on his own. He was acting according to God's purpose with regard to his son. And yes, he has power or authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life unto as many as want him to save them. Is that what your Bible says? No. Unto as many as thou hast given him. If I'm the Lord's today, I'm no better than Judas. But it pleased God to pluck me out like a firebrand out of the fire. Give me to his son. All flesh is in Christ's hands to do with what he will. But he saves. That's his distinguishing love. He saves everyone that the Father gave him. And he knew that it was for them that he had come. That's his coming in the flesh. And that he would go. His going back to God. That's his whole purpose, to come. That God might be just and justify those for whom Christ died. If Christ died for every single sinner, there is therefore now no condemnation. You just have to quit talking about judgment or condemnation. But we know that's not so. Who are saved but those that are the beneficiaries of his distinctive love and his distinguishing love. But thirdly, I want us to see here in verses 4 and 5, and we're actually going to come back to this next week because it goes on about why Christ washed their feet. But what I see here, thirdly, is the distinctive love as being a servant's love. Whose servant was he? God, God's servant for salvation was the Lord Jesus Christ. He said there, that back in Isaiah, Behold my servant, mine elect. Before there was ever any sinner's elect, there was the first elect who was Christ. And I know we're talking in terms of time, but it was from eternity. And uh, those sinners electing him. But here we have an example of just what kind of love was the Lord's for his own. It was a servant's love. He didn't come seeking glory. He didn't come to make a show of himself. Everything about him washing the disciples' feet. And that's what it describes there in verse 4. He rising from supper. So at this particular point, it was still the Passover supper that they were celebrating. And John gives us an account here that reads like that of an eyewitness. <laughs> you can imagine him being leaning on Christ's breast and now... Kind of, although reclining, sitting up to observe of what the Lord's doing and, and wondering, just like any of them, with suspense. These are like short staccato sentences that we find written here concerning how it was described. He riseth from supper. He laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. That was the work of a servant. Whenever you'd come from a distance, the first thing they did typically of a guest that came into the house was to get a bowl of water and wash the feet because it was dusty. Your feet were dirty. It's like sometimes, most of the time I do. I, I can't wait to get to the house and take off my shoes. And I'll take off my socks and I'll toss them over to the dog. My little puppy likes to chew on them. And I'll sit there and let, give my feet some air. Just let them breathe. Well, here it is a picture, and this was the servant's role, that when the guests arrived, the servant would lay aside his garments and would take a towel and gird himself and pour the water, verse 5, into a basin, begin to wash the feet and then to dry them with a towel. All of this is a picture of what a servant would do. And 
All of this the Lord is describing then, just like it says elsewhere, he didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many or the many. A lot of people have that backwards. They think that here's Christ, he came, and now we got to be doing everything for him. No, we need him. If he doesn't do the work, then nothing will be done. And so him arising from supper, all of this depicts, I believe, Christ's work from beginning to end. It means that he arose from his place of rest because he was reclining too with his disciples and eating with them. And he laid aside his garment. You think about his humiliation, his humbling himself. And, it's, and Philippians 2 says, taking on himself the form of a servant, of a man. And humbling himself and being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He laid aside his glory. Set aside his heavenly robes, if you will. And he took a towel and girded himself. That's a picture of a servant ready to go to work. That's why every time the disciples came and they brought some food, and he said, you don't know that I have a work to do that you know not of. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? This was on his mind from birth all the way to the cross, doing that work, that towel, girding himself. This was his work of salvation and uh, taking the form of a servant, pouring out the water, ready to clean, that's why Christ is described as the, the living water. It takes his work to be cleansed. And ultimately, representing his blood shed, to pour out his blood and to cleanse his own from every guilt and penalty of sin. And then when the work was finished there in verse 12, sitting down again after washing the feet. After he's done his work, he sat down. So every one of these we see as a type and picture of the servant work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But fourthly, in verses 6 through 8, this distinguishing love is an effectual love. Because here was Peter objecting. He said, you'll never wash my feet. <laughs> that was what came out. But here again is the distinctive love of Christ for him. It didn't change Christ's attitude toward him nor his work for him. He didn't understand what it was the Lord was doing. And that word my is not emphatic, having his feet washed in a matter of course. It is the person who is about to do that work that offends him. It wasn't the idea of having his feet washed, but who it is that would wash his feet. It's like with John the Baptist, when the Lord said to John the Baptist that it behooved them to fulfill all righteousness in his water baptism. Why was he baptized? Because baptism represents his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what baptism is. It's immersion. Even here, what Christ was about to do was giving an, an example of why Peter and all of them, those that he loved to the end, needed his work, his servant work, but also his cleansing work. And this is why I say that the distinguishing love of Christ is effectual love. Because Peter's objections didn't cause Christ to cease or to turn aside. It's like so many today that say, well, I believe Christ died for everybody. But alas, not everybody allows him to accomplish his work. It's not a matter of us allowing Christ to do anything. His effectual love overcomes every objection, even in our thinking to the point where in verses 9 through 11, we see here the fifth point, fifth distinctive is a complete love. <laughs> because when the Lord, when, when Peter, by God's grace and Christ's word, understood that unless he was washed, he had no part with Christ, unless Christ washed him, he had no part with him, that's when Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head, everything. <laughs> Just go ahead and bathe me. Isn't that the way it is when the Lord teaches us? You be my cleansing. You be my sanctification, Lord. You be my, my glorification. You be my justification. You be my all. That's really what he was saying to the Lord here. But Christ's love is complete. That's why he told Peter, he said, 
one who's bathed needs only to wash his feet. You don't need me to wash you from top to bottom. That would be accomplished at the cross. But here he tells him, as you walk in this world, the feet get dirty. They need cleansing. And that's a reminder of the daily cleansing because of Christ's work on our behalf, whereby he has cleansed us and he continues to cleanse us because of that complete love that he has for his own. But we're going to come back to this. This is somewhat of the introduction and take a look again at how the Lord used that example as we're going to see in verse 14. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. A lot of people read that and they think, okay, well that means literally. That's why some when they have the celebration of the Lord's table, there's a bowl of water there and if you're sitting with your neighbor then uh, you take your bowl of water and you wash their feet and they wash yours and it's become a part of ceremony for some because they take literally this word. But there's only one time that the Lord is seen here giving this example of washing the feet and it was here. When he says even as I have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. We're going to see that that has to do that that same spirit of serving one another. Even as Christ was showing why it was he came. So every member of his body is precious in his sight. And that's how different members see the others. Being humbled and submitted to one another. Lord willing, we'll look at that next time. But those are the five distinctives of... Christ's love for his own. It's a distinguishing love. It's a particular love. It's an effectual love. It's a complete love. And I'm thankful that it is so.